Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we will be talking about Royal Dutch Shell, which is one of the world's largest energy and petrochemical companies. We'll review the company's annual report to get a better idea of its business model. Then we'll look at the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. We'll perform a discounted fee cash flow DCF analysis to find the intrinsic value of the company. And finally, do an expected rate of return calculation to see if we were to invest in Shell at the current stock price, what kind of return can we expect on this investment? So let's dive in and review Royal Dutch Shell. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 20F, which is the annual report that Royal Dutch Shell filed with the SEC. This is for the fiscal year that ended December 31st, 2020. And on page 18 of this report, the company talks about its strategy and outlook. It states that in February 2021, Shell launched Powering Progress, which sets out its strategy to accelerate the transition of its business to net zero emissions in step with society, purposefully and profitably. After that, Shell talks about how it plans on achieving net zero emissions, primarily by transforming its business and finding new opportunities, such as selling more low carbon products such as biofuels, electricity generated by solar and wind power, hydrogen and charging for electric vehicles. Shell is partnering with customers, businesses and governments to address the energy transition and reduce emissions sector by sector. This includes in sectors that are harder to decarbonize such as aviation, shipping, commercial road freight, power, heating and certain parts of industry. Next, Shell talks about its business pillars where it states that it is reshaping its portfolio of assets and products to meet the cleaner energy needs of its customers in the coming decades. Shell plans on delivering its strategy through three business pillars, growth, transition and upstream. Shell points out that to support the delivery of its strategy, it is redesigning Shell to put customers at the center. This means organizing itself to help economic sectors to decarbonize by providing integrated low carbon energy solutions sector by sector. After that, Shell talks about its capital allocation approach. It states that it approaches capital allocation at three levels, enterprise, portfolio and project. The enterprise level is how it makes its decisions between increasing distributions to its shareholders, investing in its business and or strengthening its balance sheet. The portfolio level is how it allocates capital between its three pillars, that is growth, transition and upstream. And the project level is how it evaluates and prioritizes investment opportunities. Now let's look at Shell's operating segments. On page 182 of this report, the company talks about its segment information. It states that it has five operating segments, namely integrated gas, upstream, oil products, chemical and corporate. The integrated gas segment manages liquefied natural gas activities and the conversion of natural gas to gas to liquid fuels and other products, as well as the new energies portfolio. It also markets and trades natural gas, LNG, electricity and carbon emission rights, and also markets and sells LNG as a fuel for heavy duty vehicles and marine vessels. The second reportable segment is the upstream segment, which entails exploring and extracting crude oil, natural gas and natural gas liquids. It also markets and transports oil and gas and operates the infrastructure necessary to deliver them to market. In other words, the upstream segment includes the extraction, exploration as well as all the midstream activities. The third operating segment is the oil product segment, which comprises of refining and trading and marketing classes of business. The refining and trading class of business turns crude oil and other feedstock into a range of oil products which are moved and marketed around the world for domestic, industrial and transport use. The fourth operating segment is its chemical segment which operates manufacturing plants and its own marketing network. The fifth and last operating segment is the corporate segment which covers the non-operating activities supporting Shell. On the next page, the company breaks down its revenue across these operating segments. For the year 2020, the old product's third-party revenue was about $129 billion out of the total $180 billion. When we compare these revenue numbers to those of 2019, we can see that the 2020 numbers were a lot lower, primarily because of the pandemic and the drop-off in demand and sales of oil. In the year 2019, the old product's third-party revenue was about $280 billion out of the total $345 billion. Finally, on the next page, the company provides us information about its geographic areas. For the third party revenue by origin, we can see that Asia, Oceania and Africa brought in about 65 billion out of the total 180 billion dollars. That means about 36 percent of the company's revenue comes from Asia, Oceania and Africa. United States brought in about 51 billion dollars and Europe brought in about 50 billion dollars. And when we look at intangible assets, property, plant and equipment and joint ventures, Shell had about 104 billion dollars in assets in Asia, Oceania and Africa. It had about $63 billion in assets in the United States and it had about $39 billion in assets in Europe. Now that we have a brief understanding of Shell's business model, its operating segments and its revenue breakdown, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. 
Hey guys, now let's look at Shell's key ratios. I'm on Morningstar looking at Royal Dutch Shell. Under key ratios, we have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2011, Shell's revenue was about $470 billion. And for the year 2020, it's about $180 billion. When we look at the past 10 year trend, we can see that Shell's revenue was in the $400 billion range from 2011 through 2014. Then it dropped down in the $260 billion range in 2015 and 2016. And ever since 2017 through 2019, the revenue has hovered in the $300 billion range. We see a significant drop off in the year 2020, primarily because of the decreased demand due to the pandemic. Ideally, we want the company's revenue to be staying steady or increasing. However, in an oil and gas industry, it is inherent to have fluctuations in its top line number. And so is the case with Shell. We can clearly see the cyclicality of the company's top line number. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income is what we get when we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2011, Shell's operating income was about $43 billion. In the year 2019, it was about $23 billion. And for the year 2020, it was a negative number, which tells us that Shell's cost of goods and operating expenses exceeded the company's revenue. After that, looking at the net income. The net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations and taxes. Back in 2011, Shell's net income was about $31 billion. In the year 2019, it was about $16 billion. And the company reported a loss in the year 2020 as its net income was about negative $22 billion. Ideally, we want the company's net income to be staying steady or increasing. However, in the case of Shell, we can see that over the past 10 years, the company's net income has been volatile. We have seen a high of about $31 billion in 2011 to a low of about $1.9 billion in 2015 to another high of about $24 billion in 2018, another low in 2020 with a negative $21 billion. Next, looking at the dividends per share. Back in 2011, Shell paid out about $3.36 per share as dividend. And for the year 2020, it paid out about $1.91 per share as dividend. When we look at the past 10-year trend, we can see that Shell increased its dividend every year from 2011 through 2015. And from 2015 through 2019, the company's dividend payouts remained the same. And we saw a drop off in the year 2020, primarily because Shell was trying to conserve its capital amid the pandemic. After that, looking at the shares outstanding. Back in 2011, Shell had 3,111 million shares outstanding. And for the trailing 12 months, Shell has 3,899 million shares outstanding. When we look at the past 10-year trend, we can see that Shell was issuing shares every year from 2011 through 2018. Ideally, we wanted the company to buy back its shares. In other words, we want the company's shares outstanding number to be decreasing. However, in the case of Shell, the shares outstanding number were increasing from 2011 through 2018. And after the year 2018, it looks like Shell has been buying back its shares as the share count has now dropped off to 3,899 million shares from a high of about 4,174 million shares. Next, looking at the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. Back in 2011, Shell's book value was about $124 per share. And for the year 2020, it's about $40 per share. When we look at the past 10 year trend, we can see that the company's book value has always been positive, which tells us that Shell always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet. Finally, looking at the free cash flow. The free cash flow is what we get when we subtract capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Ideally, we want the company's free cash flow to be a positive number that's staying steady or increasing. Back in 2011, Shell's free cash flow was $10,470 million. And for the year 2020, it was $17,520 million. I will be using the past 10 years of free cash flows for my expected rate of return calculation. And I will be using the 2020 free cash flow number of $17,520 million for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line. So it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was at 6.58%. In the year 2019, it was 4.59%. And for the year 2020, the number was negative because the company's net income was negative. However, when we look at the 4.59% in the year 2019, what this number means is every $100 that the company made in the year 2019, by the time the company paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations and taxes, it had $4.59 left as pure profit. 
After that, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest obligations using its income in that calendar year. Back in 2011, Shell's interest coverage was at 41.59 times. In the year 2019, it was at 6.59 times. And the number was negative in the year 2020 because its income was negative. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had an interest coverage of five times or higher. Now let's look at the financial health of the company, focusing on the liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio is the comparison of the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's current ratio to be greater than 1, as it indicates that the company has more than enough current assets to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's current ratio was at 1.17, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.30. Over the past 10 years, the company's current ratio has always been greater than 1. Next, looking at the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1, as that indicates that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to meet its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was at 0.88, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.93. Over the past 10 years, the company's quick ratio has stayed fairly consistent. After that, looking at the financial leverage, the financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. A high financial leverage ratio tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's financial leverage was at 2.04, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.35. Over the past 10 years, the company's financial leverage has stayed consistent. And finally, looking at the debt-to-equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want the company's debt-to-equity ratio to be less than 1. It's even better if it's less than 0.5. Back in 2011, the company's debt-to-equity ratio was at 0.18, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.54. Shell's financial health and liquidity ratios are comparable to those of its competitor, Exxon. Now let's look at the company's current valuation to that of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States. The first item on the list is the price-to-earnings ratio. Shell does not have a price-to-earnings ratio because its earnings were negative, so a negative price-to-earnings ratio is not meaningful. S&P 500, on the other hand, has a price-to-earnings of 26.1. Next is the price-to-book. Shell has a price-to-book ratio of 1.0, whereas S&P 500 has a price-to-book of 4.3. Shell has a price-to-sales ratio of 0.9, whereas S&P 500 has a price-to-sales of 3.1. After that, price-to-cash flow. Shell has a price to cash flow of 5.7, whereas S&P 500 has a price to cash flow of 17.2. And finally, the dividend yield. Shell has a dividend yield of 3.4%, whereas S&P 500 has a dividend yield of 1.5%. So other than the price to earnings ratio on all these valuation metrics, Shell is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Hey guys, now let's look at Shell's intrinsic value. Over here, I pasted Shell's 2020 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which is at $17,520 million. I'm using an annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 5%. What this means is I expect Shell's free cash flow to grow at 5% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I expect this investment to give me a 10% return. Shell's expected long-term growth rate, I'm assuming that to be 2%. What that means is after the 10-year mark into perpetuity, I expect Shell's free cash flow to grow at 2%. The company has 3,899 million shares outstanding and has a long-term debt of $66,838 million. I got this number from the company's balance sheet. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the intrinsic value to be about $52 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the current stock price of about $40 per share, we can see that the current stock price is trading about 23.5% below the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows which come out to about $137 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10 year market perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $271 billion. From this number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $52 per share. If we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that Shell is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $18 per share. 
Finally, if we disregard the debt, in other words, if you think that Shell is going to be around forever, so there is no point for the company to worry about its debt if it's just going to be there forever, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $69 per share. Hey guys, now let's look at the expected rate of return calculation for Shell. Over here, I pasted the past 10 years of free cash flows that I got from Morningstar. All the numbers here are in millions of US dollars. This is the early free cash flow trend that we get over the years. We can clearly see the cyclicality in the company's free cash flows, which is inherent with any company in the oil and gas sector. Next, looking at the future data and predictions, I'm assuming that there's a 35% likelihood that Shell's free cash flow will grow at 5%, there's a 40% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 3%, and a 25% likelihood that its free cash flow will decline at negative 10%. These are the potential free cash flow raise that we get over the years. After taking into account the numbers of shares outstanding, which is 3,899 million shares, at the current stock price of about $40 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 11.5% on this investment. What this means is if you were to purchase a share of Shell at the current stock price of about $40 per share and hold this security through 2060, then we can expect to get an annual return of about 11.5% on this investment. Hey guys, now let's wrap it all up. We reviewed Shell's 20F annual filing with the SEC. We got an idea of its business and strategic overview. We saw that the company has five operating segments and its oil product segment brings in majority of the company's revenue. The company's revenue, operating income as well as net income over the past 10 years have been volatile, which is inherent with any energy oil and gas company. Shell has been paying steady dividend all the way up through 2019. We did see a drop in the dividend in the year 2020, primarily because the management was trying to conserve cash and not depart from its cash in the form of dividends. Over the past few years, the company appears to be buying back its shares as the company's shares outstanding number have been decreasing. After that, we looked at the company's financial leverage and liquidity ratios. We saw that the company's current ratio over the past 10 years has been greater than 1 which tells us that the company always had enough current assets to fulfill its current liabilities. Shell's financial leverage and debt-to-equity ratio are in line with its competitor, Exxon. After that, when we compared Shell's current valuation to that of the S&P 500, we found out that on all the valuation metrics other than the price-to-earnings ratio, Shell was undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Next, we performed the discounter free cash flow DCF analysis and found that when we used a 10% discount rate, the intrinsic value came to about $52 per share. And when we compare that intrinsic value to the current stock price of about $40 per share, we can see that the current stock is trading about 23.5% below the company's intrinsic value. After that, when we performed an expected rate of return calculation, we found out that if we were to purchase a share of Shell at the current stock price of about $40 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 11.5% on this investment. Overall, Royal Dutch Shell appears to be a fundamentally solid company. It is an undervalued security, which was evident when we compared the company's current valuation to that of the S&P 500, and also when we calculated the intrinsic value to be about $52, which is a lot higher than the company's current stock price of about $40 per share. As Shell moves its growth and capital allocation from its traditional oil products investments to those of more cleaner and renewable energy investments, the company is going to show lower profit margins as renewable energy sector is less profitable than the oil and gas sector. In conclusion, Shell appears to be a good long-term investment that can give you an exposure to the international market and the transition from a fossil fuel to a cleaner renewable energy system. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Royal Dutch Shell interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions as to which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I will greatly appreciate it. Thank you.